Well, hello there, and I do hope you're all well, and I do hope you all had a fantastic weekend. Right, in this video, you'll witness our James Cleverly and his amazing word for anger on the Northern Ireland Protocol, so to speak. With our hapless Foreign Office Minister James Cleverly MP, does his absolute best to convince a cross-party select committee what is Northern Ireland Protocol that is so bad that we need to rip up. He even tries to explain what is Boris Johnson and his ex extreme Brexit Tory government's position on this. And he even tries to explain what the haunted wardrobe our Jacob Rees Mogg's job description as Brexit Minister, which I have to say is hilarious, I can tell you that. And he also, in between having the Northern Ireland Protocol explained to him, this Tory MP did his best to convince the Lords that no sources of international law, or even public international laws, if you could say that, will be broken in any limited or specific way. And he even fits in the notion that it is never a good idea to, for any, any person to mark his own homework, while at the same time he was marking his own homework. Confused? You won't be when you watch this. Enjoy. Affairs Committee and a ministerial evidence session this afternoon with James Cleverly MP, who's the Minister of State uh, in the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. He's being supported this afternoon by Olaf Hendrickson Bell, who's a senior director uh, within the FCDO. Um, welcome, Minister. Um, I know how busy you are. If, if, if not least from just the list of your many responsibilities <laughs> we'll, we'll come on to. But this is a public evidence session, so a transcript will be taken, and we'll send that on to you in due course, and we'd be grateful of any corrections or revisions that need to be, to be made of that. Uh, the Minister has to leave at 3.30, and so I would be very grateful if both questions and answers could be get, uh, kept crisp, uh, so that we have some chance of getting through what is quite a challenging uh, set of questions. So you know what's going to happen here is we're going to be asking him a question. It'll take as long as he possibly can to answer it. I'm going to start. Um, Lord Frost, uh, uh, Mr. Cleverley, had a huge number of responsibilities, and those have been divided up between yourself and two of your colleagues, the Foreign Secretary and the Minister for Brexit Opportunities. I wonder if you could just describe a bit to us how that division works. Uh, thank you. The, uh, the, the decision was made, for the most part, to bring the work that Lord Frost did into the FCDO, and that helps to uh, ensure that there is uh, close cooperation, or close coordination, rather, uh, in the work that we do with the EU and its institutions and the member states of the EU at government-to-government uh, government and capital-city-to-capital-city city uh, level. So rather than going into uh, real granularity on this, I'd draw the attention of the committee to the written ministerial statement that we put out on the 24th of uh, February, which gives a comprehensive breakdown of the relationship. But as you said, ultimately, the uh, probably the most straightforward way of thinking of it is that the Foreign Secretary has taken on the primary roles that Lord Frost had. She... Uh, she co-chairs um, and myself and uh, Michael Ellis at the cabinet office we are her deputies um, of, of, of sorry of the withdrawal agreement joint committee um, there is a very close working relationship between the FCDO and the cabinet office uh, in terms of our work on this and it is, uh, I think it is the right thing to do to have our bilateral European relationships <laughs> basically managed by the same group of ministers who are doing our institution to our institution relationships with the, uh, the European Union. Um, I don't know if you want me to go on to the responsibilities under the Northern Ireland Protocol or whether that's something that you might want to pick up elsewhere. I think we're going to, to come on to that later in the evidence session. But thank you very much for that. So you haven't mentioned the Minister for Brexit Opportunities. Sorry. How, how does he fit into the equation? Uh, this should be interesting. Again, oh, he works closely with, um, uh, with Michael Ellis at the Cabinet Office. With regard to his work, of course, that is, it lends itself more to domestically focused 
uh, activities. But of course, when it comes to uh, changes that we bring about through our departure from the European Union, it's important that we coordinate that um, so that any implications that it that that, that those domestic facing decisions may have on our relationship with the European Union and member states is understood and that we discuss those and, and bottom those out uh, before we implement any of them. So it's actually a very close working relationship. We have uh, regular cross Whitehall meetings uh, which are usually chaired either by Michael Ellis or myself where um, uh, foreign ministers, cabinet office ministers that have Brexit related interests and other government departments at ministerial level uh, get to meet and coordinate our response in these areas. Clear as mud to me with that what, what, what uh, Jake Rees Mogg's job is there. Right, and so uh, just to go back then, the, the, the written ministerial statement of the 24th of February, um, I mean, that was an auspicious day with lots going on, but <laughs> no, no changes, no changes then have been made at all to the structure since then. Uh, no. <laughs> I love the pause that and the, uh, no. The, um, uh, on the government website, and looking at your long list of um, responsibilities, there is a uh, there is a, a, a leg which describes a responsibility, and I quote: "Trade and cooperation agreement negotiations, comma, including the Northern Ireland Protocol." Now, of course, the Northern Ireland Protocol is actually part of the withdrawal agreement, and so uh, does that mean that you're responsible for a lot of withdrawal agreement things as as well, or just the Northern Ireland Protocol bit? Uh, so I have I have focused for obvious reasons uh, on the Northern Ireland Protocol uh, element of that, but ultimately I do have I do have the remit right across uh, the uh, withdrawal agreement, and there are uh, other elements, some of which I, again we may come on to later on in this in this session where I have an involvement. Obviously, the the uh, the division of labour is to a large extent. Uh, defined by the areas where there is still either disagreement or resolution to be sought. There are areas that are functioning uh, well and they don't require very much ministerial level um, uh, involvement. Uh, but ultimately, the, uh, you know, the, the responsibility set out on the website do cover all elements of it. Thank you very much. Uh, now, um, we uh, were due to see Lord Frost in January, in fact, and it's taken until June for us to see um, a, a senior minister about what is a very, very complex uh, uh, situation. And we haven't split it between three committees. We are, we are the, the whole committee, as it were. And But uh, I wonder if you could just confirm to, as it were, the audience here what the agreement is about um, how often people will, will come and how often we'll hear about the, the news of, of what is going on in the complex set of negotiations. Well, I, I do regret that it's taken a while for me to uh, appear before the uh, committee. Some of that is just the bedding in and me feeling confident that I could come here in front of the committee with enough knowledge and experience of what's happened that I can actually add value, um, which which has taken a, a little bit of uh, time. Um, as you say, my ministerial responsibilities covers the uh, area that we're looking at today, plus others. So I am I, I, I'm afraid I'm not being, going to be able to commit to the, quite the regularity that Lord Frost. Uh, committed to, um, but I understand. I've just been reminded. I understand that a um, uh, uh, a proposal for the rhythm with which I would appear before the committee is going to be put forward to your uh, committee clerks. Um, I would envisage that um, that I see you, you know, on a on a fairly uh, consistent uh, basis. But as I say, the details of that I think are being uh, shared or have been shared with your uh, committee clerks. Thank you very much. Just carrying on with uh, the, the sort of the general strand. Um, one set of commentators have suggested that um, uh, because on the EU side, it's only it's, it's a very limited number of people who are engaging. And yet, uh, as we've just heard on the UK side, it's actually quite a large number of admittedly meeting regular ministers there, that inherently um, this is a weak 
structure on our, our part uh, versus the EU, which they've centralised everything in, uh, in one or two people. How would you respond to that criticism? Well, I would say that uh, it, it's understandable that as we are the nation that's leaving the European Union, we are the nation that is importing a greater degree of change. Um, and that change has uh, implications across a number of government departments, some uh, more than others. And so it's right that within the UK government, we have uh, regular meetings to ensure that all government departments that may be affected by any changes that we have initiated through our departure have uh, a voice and understanding about what those, what those are. Um, actually, I think that that is uh, you know, a healthy way for government working. I think uh, regular light touch meetings uh, where everyone uh, gets sight of you know, what might be happening in the near future, what decisions may uh, affect their departments is, is, is actually quite useful and prevents difficulties and problems uh, brewing up. Um, the fact that you seek to do it a different way, you know, I, I, that's up to them. And I'm you know, wish them the best in the uh, in in the discharging of their duty. But in my experience, and I caveat this by saying, of course, I've not seen a different structure, so I I can't really compare with what went before. It's a system that seems to be working well on our side. Thank you very much. Final royal question from me, and that is that your responsibilities include Europe, Russia, Iran. Northern Ireland for the protocol bit, and the US. Um, that, that's a pretty wide portfolio. Other commentators have suggested that that is really just so wide, it doesn't allow you to be able to do a really good job on every aspect. Would you agree with that? I think I would. Well, I would very much disagree that I'm not doing a good job, if you don't. Shocker. Am I saying it's... Uh, uh, actually, one of, the things that I, one of the things that I found is because I would suggest, with the exception of Iran, <laughs> that is a list of countries, many of whom are like-minded on some of the very big issues of the day, including uh, uh, Euro-Atlantic defence and security issues, economic issues, environment, uh, human rights, etc., etc., because we're quite closely aligned. Actually, we find ourselves often talking about the same set of subjects and being able to coordinate the UK's voice uh, across that group of like-minded partners on the interests that we share um, is very important. So when I find myself in the United States of America, uh, as I did quite recently, discussing many of the same issues that I discussed when I went over to Brussels, uh, that for me reinforces the fact this is a actually quite a logical combination of uh, international partners and again I think in some of the questions you got later on perhaps um, about our our you know, collective response to Russia's in great, uh, invasion of Ukraine I think we'll be able to demonstrate that that has actually been a very very good working relationship um, which I've been able to see across Europe and across uh, the Atlantic and with the uh, uh, and the reason I kept Iran from my old Middle East North Africa portfolio is because, unsurprisingly, because of things like the JCPOA, because of our sanctions and, and security policy, the interests of the US, the UK, and our European uh, partners, both EU and non-EU member states, again, requires a fair degree of coordination. So, as I say, I think it's working well. I'm perhaps not the best person to judge. Um, you know, I probably shouldn't be marking my own homework. Now there you go, there's a man who says it's probably not wise for people to mark their own homework while he's marking his own homework. Um, but I think it's a, a, a logical combination of, uh, of partner states for me to be dealing with as a minister. Thank you very much indeed. We come to well, if anyone does know what our Jacob Rees-Mogg's job actually is, can you not only let the ghost of Christmas pass, no, and also can you do the same with our James not so cleverly as well? That was hilarious. <laughs> he just talked utter nonsense, word salad and drivel, didn't he? But for the idea that he might have far too many jobs to undertake, he might be right. It, it might not be a problem for him at all. But he did say he didn't feel confident enough to do this cross-party select committees meeting until now. 
might be right on one thing. People should never mark their own home, okay? Anyway, do hope you enjoy the video. And till the next time, I shall bid you farewell and um, take care.